Hi everyone. Hope you're having a great day. I'm having honestly a fantastic day. The weather outside is absolutely terrific. Unfortunately, you can't see a thing of that since I had to put my blinds down as you will maybe want to see me as well. But let's get started. I would like to present to you today how to test Visual Studio Code extensions. And let's start out uh, with me. My name is Dan. I'm a software developer working at SUSE as part of the developer engagement program. So I'm my task is mostly to build tools for other developers. I'm also a package maintainer for some open SUSE packages. I'm also a, I also maintain a bunch of packages in Fedora. And there I'm also a member of the i3 special interest group where we've created the new i3 spin for Fedora 34. One of my big passions is testing, and that's also one of the reasons why I have invested quite a lot of work into testing Visual Studio Code extensions and why I'm also giving this talk. In case you want to stalk me on social media, you can find a few handles further below where I occasionally post stuff about technology. But let's uh, take a look at what we'll do today. And as the title of the talk suggests, it's about testing extensions for Visual Studio Code. So this is really from a developer perspective. And uh, the main agenda is, well, how to test extensions. And I'll cover uh, and I'll be covering the three big approaches that there are unit testing, manual testing, and integration testing. Well, and at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. And depending on how much time there's left, I can maybe also show you a thing or two in case there's any interest. So first, let's get started with Visual Studio Code. I mean, I guess you uh, you probably know Visual Studio Code. It's a cross-platform IDE developed by Microsoft. It's built with web technologies. So this whole thing is built in TypeScript, which is a superset of JavaScript. Uh, it's extremely popular. So it, uh, it started to be, uh, it, I think it became a thing in 2015 and it breached 50% market share according to a Stack Overflow developer survey in 2019 and it grew even more. So this is an insanely popular editor. It has an extremely good uh, initial user experience, which also uh, explains why it's so popular. And it has a very rich extension ecosystem and especially a very, very well documented extension API. So in case you ever feel like creating an extension yourself, Go for it. This is really, really simple. And also a bit for my background, I've spent more, uh, a good chunk of last year uh, developing the Open Build Service Connector, which is an extension for Visual Studio Code that bridges Visual Studio Code itself to the um, to the open build service, which is the, uh, in case, uh, in case you don't, uh, don't know it, it's essentially the combination of Pegua plus Koji, uh, in Fedora. So, but now let's get started with the actual topic at hand, testing extensions. And, uh, so in my impression, testing, uh, really just the extensions for VS code, this is pretty tough. And why is that tough? Well, the main reason is you are testing a UI and UIs have unfortunately the disadvantage that these things carry a lot of state. So imagine your visuals, uh, your uh, essentially any UI, but now take uh, VS Code. If you have something open, all of, the, all of the UI elements that are present, this is a certain state that's present. And all of the state influences this uh, how your extension interacts with that and what the outcome of that is so this means if you want to actually write meaningful tests you will have to pre-create all the important state yourself feed it into your extension get the state that your extension produces out of that and check that it actually matches and that's pretty hard because uh, your VS Code editor window, there's a ton of information. You have to extract all the important information. You have to, uh, you have to find the right one. You have to ensure that you actually got the right one and so on and so on. So this is, this is not a VS Code specific problem. This is a UI testing specific. Uh, this is a general problem when testing user interfaces and uh, graphical user interfaces specifically. Also, uh, if you have created an extension, 
then usually the important part is that you have certain workflows. Imagine a Git extension or a subversion or an extension that connects to Kubernetes or to OpenShift or whatnot. You want a workflow to be working, to be functional. So let's say I want to be able to commit things. And I am, in my impression, in recent years, it's been very popular to write unit tests and to rely on unit tests. But unit tests are really only good for testing individual chunks of code. They are not good at testing uh, really workflows because a workflow is a combination of a whole ton of things. But a unit test tests just one tiny, teeny, tiny bit. And you're actually interested in the big picture. Well, and a last thing here is uh, what you uh, so what you test is not necessarily what you see because uh, if you start out pre-creating this UI state for your tests, you can easily create state that would never appear like that in practice. And also, if you then actually want to check the result, um, it all it uh, effectively means anyway that you'll be you'll be running your extension. You take a look at the output, and then you take a um, and then you check what comes out of it, and then you test that. So uh, effectively, you still have to take a look at the actual stuff that happens. So now let's uh, let's get started with actually testing. And uh, first, a general notice: usually extensions have to rely on some kind of external service. So whether this be, for instance, external libraries. So imagine you have a um, imagine that you have um, that you need to store credentials somewhere. Yeah, these need to be stored in the uh, in the operating system's keyring. That's how it's usually done from VS Code. And uh, depending on your on how you're exactly testing, you have to mock these out. So I'd say for unit tests, mock them out. I'll cover that later for integration tests. Um, you can use stuff like LD preload and write fake libraries. I've done that for the open build service connector. I have a fake um, lib secret that uh, just reads credentials from a file. And so it doesn't mess with the developer's machine. If you have external services, so imagine Kubernetes or some cloud provider, um, take a look whether upstream has some sort of staging environment uh, or if uh, preferably a development environment. So usually upstream projects have development environments that can be just spun up for testing. Use these to test against them. You want to be testing against the real thing. Um, especially for integration tests, test against the real service. Otherwise, uh, the service will change something or something will behave slightly differently than what you mocked out. And it will, your tests will be green, your actual service, uh, your actual extension will fail. Good, let's get to unit testing. So unit testing means you have one functionality. Uh, so you test one teeny tiny chunk of code and you test one specific functionality of this. So usually it means you take, for instance, a function, you take a class and you want to check, okay, does this, uh, does this function fulfill its purpose? And as I already ranted quite extensively, anything that touches the UI will need extensive setup and teardown and verification will be a pain in the backside. So um, if you want to really check that certain, uh, certain elements work the way they are displayed the way you want them, it will be a lot of work and I would recommend not to do that. If you have external services, and want to and need to communicate with them. My recommendation is for unit tests, mock them out. Uh, so if you have, for instance, credentials, use some mocking library for that um, or do dependency injection since your unit tests should be, uh, should be relatively fast. And if you now spin up uh, testing environments, it will take a lot of time. If you want to get started with unit testing, this is fairly simple. So the upstream documentation has a good uh, has an example. If you use the official generator for a VS Code extension, then that will set it up yourself. And how these unit tests uh, these use the module that's called VS Code Tests. Uh, 
And what that effectively does is it spins up a temporary VS Code instance, loads your extension into that, and then it executes all your unit tests that you defined. So you will have a real VS Code instance running. You can do all kinds of stuff that the VS Code API exposes to you. And um, with that, you have and uh, your unit tests run essentially in the real thing. This is fairly straightforward. So there's um, it's it can be sometimes a bit tricky to get it run on a CI as you have to have to have an X server running. But uh, again, the upstream documentation is fairly good in this example. A tiny catch is if you want to extract test coverage, the upstream documentation does not cover that. Um, and it's also a bit nasty to get that running, but uh, fortunately, Connor Pete has um, has an, uh, a really good example for that, and it's linked in the slides. So if you if you uh, want to uh, want to use this code snippet yourself, go ahead and just steal it. I did the same for my extension. Good. So I'd now like to uh, go over some uh, some specific parts of uh, of unit testing that I found interesting, uh, particular or surprising maybe. So one thing is extension settings. Depending on your extension, you might have to uh, you might have to write or read settings because you have hundreds of them. Um, in that case. Uh, this is fairly straightforward since you have a real VS Code instance running. So you can just read, write, modify them to your liking. Since you also have a testing environment, it doesn't mess with your real settings. That's nice. Um, the only thing that you should really keep in mind is clean up after yourself. So if you uh, use some post test hook and, um, and uh, remove all your temporary settings that you made since subsequent tests could then otherwise fail. Yeah, that's essentially it. Events. So if you have worked with the VS Code API, then you'll then you'll see that there's um, then you'll have seen events, and uh, an event is essentially, uh, as you can see in this. Uh, so events are uh, are typically used in Visual Studio Code to signal. Uh, to event listeners that something happened. For instance, user selected something, user clicked uh, somewhere, some property changed, and how these uh, how these run. So here you have a uh, here you have the on did change value event, and um, how this works is you pass a function into that, and uh, every time this event is uh, this event happens, that function gets executed. Um, this also can be used, uh, so you should test these if they include a whole bunch of business logic. The only catch with them is the Visual Studio Code itself will not await promises. So if you pass an as asynchronous function, like in this example here, Visual Studio Code will just execute it and not wait for the promise to resolve. So my recommendation is implement some fake events yourself. This is really straightforward. If you want to take uh, a look how this is done, uh, steal my implementation from the uh, from the Open Build Service Connector. It will be linked on one of the last slides. Disposables. So um, disposables are essentially a workaround for JavaScript being a garbage collected language and not having finalizers. And these are uh, destructors. So um, a whole bunch of uh, of the VS Code API returns a so-called disposable. That's just an object that has a dispose function, and this unregisters it from. So, for for example, if you have a, if you have registered a command, uh, then the function that registers a command um, gives you a disposable that will unregister it. And the the idea here is you can't register a command twice. So uh, just keep in mind, everything that returns a disposable should be actually disposed of after a single test. And for that, most test runners have some some kind of after or after each hook that runs after a test or after a test suit or after each test. And so just keep in mind to get rid of them. UI elements, as I said now twice, um, don't check them preferably or and if you really want to check them really check only the interesting parts so don't check uh, all the uh, don't check the whole data structure your test will otherwise fail on every vs code update you don't want to do that so 
really just check for the for the part that you really really care about for example the icon yeah check that you actually use the correct icon under a certain condition and keep it uh, keep this part as small as possible and a general recommendation here is um, structure your code so that the, your main business logic can be very well tested and the UI part is as small as possible, since otherwise you're going to have a very, very bad time with QA. It's going to be, it's going to be very annoying. That should be it for unit testing. Let's go to manual testing. And now you might say, wait, manual testing, you mean like doing it yourself? Yes, I mean exactly do that. Do it yourself, um, which might sound like a very weird suggestion given today's world where we try to automate essentially everything and automate ourselves out, uh, out of our job. In a, of course, that's not going to happen. But so when does this make sense? Um, the, Manual testing really makes sense if you have a kind of a one-shot extension. So you've written it once and you expect your future changes to be really, really small, which is usually not going to happen. But, uh, you know, it, uh, if you anticipate that, you could go for manual testing. Or if you have a really complex environment that's essentially impossible to create automatically or you have to wait for certain conditions that take ages and... Uh, doing that automatically is very, very hard. In that case, you can go for manual testing. And my recommendation here is make yourself a test plan. So make a checklist, write down what should you, what should be done exactly in what steps, what are your expectations, make yourself a tick box that you tick and before every release you go through the whole thing if you have um, you can even use some test management system like kvt cms if you are familiar with that you can plug that into this but yeah not necessarily my recommendation and so let's go for integration testing since manual testing is effectively manual integration testing and it just means let a machine do it so you test the main workflows of your extension um, and you effectively let something click through VS Code and do all the stuff and verify that everything that comes out um, is actually what you expected. So um, for that, I found a very nice module that's called VS Code Extension Tester, developed mainly by Jan Richter from Red Hat. And uh, this leverages the simple fact that Visual Studio Code is built on web technologies. The whole thing runs in Electron. That's a headless Chrome browser. So you can use all the cool stuff, all the cool testing libraries that are out there to test web pages. Um, you can use these to test Visual Studio Code. And one of these is Selenium WebDriver. And uh, what VS Code Extension Tester does is it wraps all the calls to the uh, to the actual DOM, so to the actual HTML stuff that's created by Visual Studio Code, and gives you a convenient API that looks like this. So you can say, "Hey, I give me a new give me a new text editor," then it can open uh, open a certain file, set the text, and so on and so on. And this works uh, this works quite well in practice. The API is also pretty nice to use. So what should you test with that? My recommendation would be find your main workflows um, and try to try to identify really the more main and most interesting workflows that you are going to uh, that you really want to care about. Go here for an 80 20 rule. So try to cover with 20% of the work, 80% of your code. Since your test runs, they will take a while to run. And don't test corner cases or some minor regressions that are hard to, uh, that are hard to reach. Since that's, um, I don't think that's something that integration tests should do. That's more something for unit tests. How should you test? So upstream, uh, the VS Code extension tester uses Mocha. I would suggest you use the same as a test runner in this case. Um, Mocha also supports root hooks. 
So these are essentially hooks that run before all tests and after all tests and use these to really uh, s set up your development environment. If you need, uh, so uh, put, keep in mind, you can override environment variables like the home directory, like uh, LD library path, LD preload. You can inject all kinds of external symbols. If you need a, uh, if you need passwords from libsecret, then, uh, use your uh, use a custom lib secret if you need another library use another library if you need if you need to uh, sub process into git use a fake git and so on so that you have more control and then run each of your individual steps as uh, individual so called it steps that's just how it's called in mocha and be done with that so downside is you won't be able to run them in parallel but you can't do that anyway um good so let's take a look at a few of the catches uh the the integration tests especially with vs code extension tester they are relatively slow and resource demanding so the uh, if your machine is under load then sometimes you'll get random timeouts which is annoying especially if you run your tests on a ci because your beefy development machine is not comparable to the ci worker that you share with 50 other people uh, you should also definitely avoid explicitly sleeping in your tests. Unfortunately, the upstream examples include that in a few places. So that's uh, you should avoid that because, again, that will fail on the CI. Then also another thing is um, certain elements in VS Code are invisible by default. So, for instance, certain buttons only appear if you if you hover over another element with the mouse, but that's a solvable problem. It's just uh, something to, that you should keep in mind. And the last thing is you will not get test coverage out of that. That is more or less impo effectively impossible. On the other hand, you shouldn't, in my opinion, rely on test coverage from integration tests anyway. So... Good. And since I'm already running pretty uh, low on time, here are a few links that you can find in the original slide, uh, in the slides. The slide source, co uh, the slide source code is here on GitHub. If you want to take a look, the obligatory legal slide with uh, who owns what the copyright. And now I'm over. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dan. We have one question for you from Brian. Hi, Dan. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you ever tried to mock certain parts of the VS Code API and how would you go about it? Uh, yeah, so I I have done that. Um, um, it really depends on which parts of the VS Code API you want to, uh, you want to mock out. Yeah, this is uh, th this really depends on which uh, which parts of the API you are you are thinking about. So, um, so I... maybe it would be a good idea to perhaps discuss this with Brian in Discord, maybe in more yeah, detail, because so. uh, yeah, like you said, it depends. So, uh, so Dan, Dan told us that he will be available in Discord, right after yes, the talk. I'll, I'll be there. So. And that's it for the questions. So I think we can wrap it up. Thank you, Dan. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thank you for attending, guys. Uh, and like we said, uh, Dan will be uh, in the Discord server after this talk, so you can reach out to him there. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.